Open Door is a fairly young company by Silicon Valley standards. Why did you decide to go the SPAC route and why so fast? Well, there is a premium on speed right now. I think there's a lot of perception that post-election, the volatility in the United States may increase in the markets. Um, you know, who knows what the driver is, whether it's healthcare, election stability, predictability, policy changes. So many, many companies that are ready to be public companies are focused on time to market. There's advantages to being a public company. As you know, I'm a big fan of being a public company early in a company's trajectory. I've written a chapter in a book called High Growth Handbook that explains all the benefits. And I think many, many CEOs are recognizing that there's significant benefits in terms of transparency, accountability, and access to capital in being a public company. So how are you advising your companies right now in terms of whether or not to do this? What should the numbers be? What should your revenue look like? How do you know if this is the process for you? Uh, to me, as soon as a company passes $50 million in revenue and has predictability and visibility into its future prospects with high growth upside, it should be a public company. That said, the process is shorter. There's not as much due diligence. How do investors know whether or not they should take a risk on these companies? Do they bet on the jockey or the horse? Well, I don't. I, I disagree that there's less diligence. Uh, I don't think that's actually true. I think uh, there's just as much diligence in an S4 stock process as in a traditional S1. There are some subtle differences, and we can talk about those, but I don't think the, the quality or the standard or bar is any different. What about the direct listing route, which, of course, Palantir opted for, your longtime friend and, and colleague, Peter Thiel, um, one of the co-founders of Palantir. Some investors have been frustrated by uh, the process and the returns thus far. Do you think Palantir made the right choice? Well, I think basically everything from a traditional IPO to a direct listing and a SPAC are, are all very similar processes and there are different tools for different companies that have different needs. Some companies need to raise a lot of capital and a traditional IPO may be a very good choice for them. Some companies actually are profitable and don't need additional capital and a direct listing absolutely makes more sense. Some companies have additional premiums on speed or want to guide more constructively into the future one or two years out and a SPAC may make many, much more sense for that for that type of company. So I think all of these are legitimate options and Dreesen Horowitz, which is a fund we compete with, published a very interesting blog post that explains all the choices and the pros and cons of each technique and I think each board of directors and each CEO should evaluate them very carefully. When it comes to Palantir, there's also been concerns about the governance and how much control Peter Thiel and the other co-founders have retained. Is that something that investors should be concerned about? Well, without speaking to, uh, specifically about any one company, because as you know, these uh, sort of special class roads, uh, rights have been applied to a vast preponderance of companies from the New York Times to Google over the years. Um, I personally don't believe in special class voting. Um, I've always been opposed to that. I think it should be one share, one vote. But that's a you know, sort of train that's left the station that has nothing to do with Palantir. <laughs> OK, um, let's talk about the market dynamics right now. We've got a big presidential election coming up, a lot of um, potential volatility ahead in the middle of this pandemic. Airbnb is a company that, that that Founders Fund invested in a long time ago. They're looking at going public in December. Um, is there a risk there, given that the IPO window has remarkably been, been open for the last few weeks? A lot of these tech IPOs have done very well. But is December too late? Could that be a bad time? Well, again, I can't speak to a specific company like Airbnb that you know we at Founders Fund or I personally may be a shareholder in. But generally speaking, I think that post-election is more treacherous for any company that wants to go public, and, and public companies as well may see some more you know, choppiness and volatility in the market. I think there's a premium on going public in 2020 because if Biden is the next president, he almost surely will raise capital gains tax rates. And so the net effect of return to many people in 2021 may be very different than it is in 2020. So I would expect to sell off in public equities in the end of 2020, if the Democrats win, the certainly the presidency and the Senate, uh, we're definitely in for a tax increase. Interesting. So the debate about politics and business has been continuing here in Silicon Valley, and you don't shy away from any debates. And I know certainly not this one. We were just talking about Coinbase CEO Brian Armstrong 
basically banning political activism at work unless it pertains to cryptocurrencies. Now there are 60 employees who are leaving the company. Um, we've seen uh, various CEOs taking a stand on both sides of this issue. Jack Dorsey, um, your former colleague at Square, says that Brian Armstrong is basically going to be on the wrong side of history. What do you think? I think he will clearly be on the right side of history. Um, you saw the data today that came out that even with a very generous offer of six months, uh, you know, basically free money, only 5% of the workforce decided to take the free money. Uh, so, you know, like the trouble at work is created by a very small minority of employees and companies have been too sort of um, afraid uh, to crack down on a very small fraction of people. But Coinbase employees voting with prestigious feet at 5% is showing the high watermark of the employee activism. I think Facebook's been pretty stringent. Um, I think a couple of years ago, Mark and Cheryl decided to basically say, you know, there's limits to what you can do at Facebook. And if you don't like it, there's plenty of other jobs in the world. And I think more companies need to do that. It's not surprising to me that the more of the monopoly a company has, the greater the employee dissonance is. So, you know, Google, where they've been running a monopoly for many years, employees have a lot of free time uh, to stir up activism at work. Many companies actually have to, per Brian's email, focus on their mission or they just won't be successful companies. So, you know, I think that this is a luxury at the top 1% of companies in many, many ways. Most companies do not have the time and energy to do anything except improve their contribution margins, return, improve their growth, improve their CAC. You know, there's just so many fundamentally challenging things in building a real company, but the monopolists have plenty of time to give their employees 20% off or allow them to create, you know, sort of internal wars over various policy issues. Okay, so you use the word monopoly several times there. The House is recommending a dramatic overhaul to competition law that could lead to the breakup of Facebook, Google, Apple, Amazon. Are they, are those four companies monopolies? Should they be broken up? No, Google Google may have some monopoly products and some monopoly issues. The others absolutely do not. I mean, Apple doesn't even have a majority market share in any product that they sell. Um, so it's just silly. The House report is intellectually bankrupt. It's one of the dumbest pieces of paper I've ever read from the government. For example, empirically, it argues that VCs are afraid of investing in technology and innovation because of the powers of those four companies. That's just factually false. Since 2013, uh, venture capital has been on an explosive tear. There's more and more venture capitalists. There's more and more dollars. There's more and more companies that get funded every year. It's the hottest. I've, so I've been, spent 20 years in Silicon Valley. This is the hottest venture market in my entire career, literally this month. Um, so it's just absolutely fiction. It's, it's, a re it's really intellectually fake news um, put out by the government. And I, it really is embarrassing. Fake news put out by the government, Keith. That's a that's a dramatic statement, even coming from you. It's it's actually. Why do you think it's fake news? Because the, the people there are just either completely ignorant or intentionally ignorant about business. So at the end of the day, Scott Cooper yesterday from Jason Horowitz published the stats. Anybody with a fundamental spent five minutes researching it would know that venture capitalism is increasing, innovation in startups is increasing, not decreasing. And there's no empirical data that supports the argument put out by the House report. There's not a single piece, shred of evidence anywhere in society that supports that argument. It's completely manufactured and fabricated. So you alluded to this, but what is your prediction for the investing climate in Silicon Valley in 2021 coming out of a pandemic, hopefully, out of a presidential election, uh, potentially still being in an economic recession, we don't know. Um, what is the state of investing and, and opportunity in Silicon Valley in that environment? Well, nobody knows, uh, truthfully. And, you know, we, one would have guessed post-March that, you know, we'd be investing more cautiously at lower valuations, just given the turbulence in the world, given the issues uh, that the world's confronting. But public market valuations have been off the charts. And over the summer, private market valuations started catching up with the public comparables. And so right now, it, 
it could not be a better time for any entrepreneur to raise money at any stage. I suspect some of that does change. There's a delinking between late stage rounds and early stage investing. So when we invest in seed or series A companies very early in a company's trajectory, we actually really don't care what the public markets are doing because we're investing five to 15 years ahead of when those companies are growing up. So it would be irrational to try to project what the world's like in 2030 right now. But that's what we're really doing when we fund the seed and series A company is building a company for 2030. Okay. The, late, the later stage rounds, the companies that you know more and more people are familiar with because more and more company uh, consumers use their product almost by definition, absolutely there's a relationship between how they're valued and their access to capital and how the public markets perform. But those are those are more tightly linked and, and somewhat more in jeopardy post-election.